And coming up this Saturday, it's University of North Carolina against Pittsburgh. 1230 game time. There's a pregame show at 12 right here. Your exclusive home for ACC football, WBBZ TV. Right now, we have with us from the Buffalo News, Tim Graham. And Tim, it's great to have you back on the show. And always uh, good to be here. Tim, you not you not only cover the Bills, you cover the entire NFL. And of course, for for a period of time, you work for ESPN, uh, covering the NFL. But first, I want to talk about the Bills. I mean, you saw the first segment, and you know, I really I appreciate Doug Marone and the way he talks to the media, and he's pretty much a no nonsense kind of guy, which reporters do appreciate when you go in there because especially when you're losing after a while you're tired of hearing the same old excuses up to sunday's game i think collectively western york thought that approach by marone has shown you know uh he's had results they're not winning games but they look better they're more competitive then they took a step back sunday i have to say that um yesterday was the first time i ever heard a head coach take the heat off the media which is essentially what he did because, and a very astute move by him, I'm not saying that it was uh, scripted by any sense, but the media comes under fire for being negative all the time. And a lot of uh, the cases is we're just writing what we see. The Bills have been negative for 13 years of not making the playoffs. It's going to be a 14th straight season. And it was almost like there's a certain segment of fans that just gets tired of it. It's a cognitive dissonance of just constantly hearing negative, negative, negative. Uh, so they take it out on the media. Stop telling us these negative things. And it was Doug Marone essentially yesterday saying, you're writing what you see, and it's my job to change it. And he was almost apologizing to the press corps uh, for not being able to write yeah. more positive things. And uh, you're right, Bob, about uh, everything had looked pop more positive Heading into the game, it felt like there was still a season to be played beyond Sunday in Pittsburgh. After that game and with the way it went, you were left with a crushing feeling that the season's over. Even though there are six games left, that's a lot. That's almost half a season. The feeling when you left Heinz Field, at least for me as a reporter, was this, season, this season's over. Well, and I think uh, a lot of that has to do with the play, obviously, of E.J. Manuel. Fred Jackson said last night, Marona said, everybody has said the right things. It wasn't Manuel's fault. But I think the way Manuel had left the game in Cleveland and the, as, as he was showing the signs of development, uh, the way he played against Pittsburgh, really, it was, you look at how Toole played, you look at how Thad Lewis played, certainly nobody played perfectly. But the offense moved much better under both those other rookies than under EJ. Yeah. And uh, EJ Manuel said after the game, he insisted that he was not rusty in Pittsburgh. And uh, I think Bill's fans and Bill's management better hope that he was rusty because if he wasn't, and that's the type of uh, performance that you can expect even on an occasional basis, then I think that the Bills have to start considering what they're going to do with their first-round draft pick next year because that's not the type of performance that you can build or use as a foundation for your future. It was a game that was incredibly winnable, especially not only were the Steelers reeling heading into the game, the Bills have fantastic field position on their first three possessions and come away with three points. Right. And that, that was the turning point. That, that really was the game right there in, in, many cases, in, in many ways that you want to slice it. So and that, a lot of that falls on E.J. Manuel, his inability to complete passes. He was, he was inaccurate. He, his footwork wasn't there. He just didn't seem to be able uh, to handle it. And, yes, he had the great comeback against Carolina. Uh, at uh, Ralph Wilson Stadium early in the season. And I think a lot of people were focusing on, wow, we have a quarterback here. But if you take a look at all the other performances, it's been far from special. Well, he's been much better at home than he has been on the road, too, which is another concern. Uh, C.J. Spiller uh, was rarely used against the Steelers, unable to get on track. He did a lot of lateral running, which I'm sure the coaches weren't happy about. Yesterday, Doug Marone really didn't give him a vote of confidence as to how they see him fitting into the offense. You think C.J. Spiller's in trouble? I don't think he's in trouble, but it sure is a far drop from we're going to hand him the ball until he throws up. Uh, and uh, that was the graphic analysis that uh, Nathaniel Hackett had right. during training camp, that they're just going to constantly just feed him the ball, feed him the ball, feed him the ball. And, yes, injuries kind of knocked him off course. There's no way uh, – well, I don't want to say no way, uh, but he's not going to have a 1,000-yard season. And I think he – there were people – coming into the season that had 2,000 in mind for C.J. Spiller based on what he did last year. Uh, but the injuries start to pile up. But then 
a week earlier against the Kansas City Chiefs, he looked like C.J. Spiller right. from last year. And then against Pittsburgh, uh, the field was chewed up. I'm not making excuses. The field was chewed up because Pitt had played Notre Dame the night before. Uh, there was a lot of paint on the field to cover up dirt and things like that. So maybe the cutting was an issue for him. As a po- He's just not a between-the-tackles runner. And yes, he's going to zip through the line for a big gain here or there like he did against Kansas City. But if you're going to give him a steady diet, he's a guy who needs to be put in space. Uh, he needs to, and then occasionally run him up yeah. the middle as a surprise. And Hackett's offense doesn't seem to lend itself to He that. doesn't get the ball in the pass game hardly at all. I think he's had, uh, you know, he gets maybe one or two balls uh, a game in terms of, you know, uh, from passing. And uh, that's something that Chan Gailey was able to do. Fred Jackson has talked about on the show that they have gone to Coach Hackett and Marone about wanting to do the screen pass more. It worked very well for them last year, especially with C.J., and Fred likes it too. And they had done more of that with Lewis and even with Tool, but for whatever reason, when E.J.'s in the game, he doesn't seem to throw as many screen passes, and you know he's not making the calls, so it's coming from upstairs. Right, and that's something that there's a lot of frustration. I talked to Stevie Johnson uh, after the game one-on-one out by the buses uh, in Pittsburgh, uh, before they head to the airport, and he, he said his frustration is is higher than ever, and he's been on a lot of bad teams, and it's because he thinks he sees the talent on this roster, and for whatever reason, it's just yeah. not coming to fruition. Two minutes left. I want to. I don't want to forget about talking about the Miami situation. You know, every day there's something new comes out. Yeah. The players have defended it incognito. Uh, the owner came out. Uh, you know. Basically, so we're going to get to the bottom of this, although it, every, there's a lot of speculation. He, he never mentioned the GM in any of this, so that they, they're just thinking there may be, he may be cut loose. But this has exposed the NFL locker room. I mean, what happened in Miami, although it may be, the, certainly when you see a text message, you know, that explicit, it, it, it raises eyebrows. But let's face it, the NFL locker room or any football locker room is not your normal place for normal behavior. That's true, um, but I think there are some things that are indefensible, and that's where I think we're seeing the curtain pulled back, and it's being pulled back in a number of ways. We're seeing it pulled back from a medical standpoint. We're seeing it pulled back uh, in regard to the locker room and bullying, and uh, you even see with the uh, groundswell of support against the Washington uh, football team's nickname uh, that I don't say anymore, uh, trying to... I think that there is is a... uh, there's a movement afoot in, in all the sports. And baseball, with its big sp- suspensions last year with steroid users, I think to, to clean themselves up and to actually make themselves presentable as you know, something that isn't uh, to be tucked away in a corner when you're, uh, when you're not thinking about the game or, or you're eating your, your nachos and your dip on Sunday afternoon. This is something that uh, the leagues want to make sure that parents are okay sending their kids into these environments to right. play at a youth level, the high school level, all that stuff. Between head injuries and concussions uh, and now this, there's, uh, football has never been under the microscope that I can remember like this where the game, I think, no. may be in jeopardy in some ways, uh, some forms of the game. I think so. 20 years down the road, we may be looking at something totally different. And my theory on why baseball went so hard against steroid users last year Uh, is because I think baseball sees an opportunity here to become America's pastime again. Football is wobbly right now, because especially with the head injury issues. And I think that uh, people are more and more are not as enthused to to sit and watch these guys bang their heads against each other. Uh, And I think we can go to hockey, too. What about hockey with the head injuries? And the Sabres have been at front and center with that, with John Scott and Patrick Coletta. I think the the Sabres should be lauded for being a little ahead of the curve by what what they're doing with Patrick Coletta now, because I think they see this is not this is being taken away from yeah. the game we can't keep uh, we can't keep um, encouraging this Tim I want to thank you so much for coming out I always look forward to reading your articles and thanks for being on thanks, the show Bob. always a pleasure hey we'll be back we're going to take a look at the UB basketball program right after this <laughs> 